Hey everyone, and welcome back to The Pod and the Pendulum, the horror movie podcast covering every horror movie franchise, one movie, one episode at a time. I'm your host, Mike Snoonian, joined once again by the very excited co-host, Jerry Smith, tonight. This has been my end game. This has been my long con from joining the show at the beginning is just to one day talk about this movie. So This is it. I yes. think after tonight show's over, like welcome <laughs> yeah. to the series finale. It's been a, it's been a fun time, show. guys. It's it's been it's a been ride. good, but you know. You know what's interesting is like usually, you know, I do a lot of notes and I'll share them like way ahead of time and then um, we'll kind of, you know, in some movies, like, I'm like, ah, this was an enjoyable movie, but I think I can kind of wing this one, which is what this falls under. And, like, mid-afternoon, like, get the ding, like, <laughs> I got my notes, you know, which Jerry's like, I got my notes if you want to add to them. Like, they're here. Here you go. And I swear to God, like, I'm not being facetious. I think you did more notes for Joyride 3 Roadkill than literally <laughs> all six Alien movies. It's which so you just kind of funny. were able to wing like right off the top of your head like I've it, seen this movie so many times which is so weird being the what movie it is I know so it's you know and even tonight you're like hey you know I've got my audacity set up I've got you know where's the zoom link let's go you know <laughs> like you were counting down the minutes before we hit yes. play on the show minutes. So what is it about this movie, Jerry? Like, what in particular makes you such... Because it's a fun movie. Like, you know, I think listeners that thought we were going to come on here and slag it um, are going to be... I don't know if disappointed's the right word. Cause I think, you know, generally speaking, we tend to be pretty positive anyway. Um, if you were looking for more third-wave emo punk talk <laughs> this week, I think you'll be disappointed, unfortunately, because... Uh, I think we're just here to talk the movie. So, Jerry, what is it about uh, Joyride 3 Roadkill? Like, it seems to have, like, a really fond place in your heart. So where is it? it? I think some of it comes with nostalgia and how I experienced the film for the first time. And some of it comes from just, like, loving the movie. I used... Back in the day, I used to write for Fangoria. Uh, before, like, the new relaunch, you know, during, like... The original run, I was a writer for Fangoria, and I, you know, I'd do interviews, I'd go to set visits, I'd do all these things, and I would help host events for people. Uh, one day, I got an email from my then boss, Rebecca McKendry, mm -hmm. and she was like, "Hey, we're hosting this special screening of Joyride Three. I don't know if you want to come into town to help me, you know, rep Fango for it and stuff." Uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, is there any way you can help? And I was just like, well, you know, I have to go to court today for like a big custody battle and I have so much going on. Wait, and you it's didn't skip the custody battle. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Not for Joy Ride 3. But, uh, it was like a huge epic day in court for me. And plus the drive it would have been like about two and a half, almost three hours afterwards just to make it in time for the screening. So I went to the court battle and it was for my oldest, which uh, I, I don't talk about very much because yeah, I like to respect their privacy. Uh, but it was basically I had to go to court, Cliff Notes version, I had to go to court because my ex-wife felt that my oldest, who was in their teens at the time, uh, shouldn't be allowed to watch any horror films at all. Uh, and that is 100, that's 100% That's one what the core battle is for. Was that, if you don't mind me asking, was that sure, done sure. because she wanted to mess with you or because she yes. had it against horror movies? No, no, no. It's 100% messed with me. Okay. Uh, and so uh, my oldest was a huge fan of Your Next and various films and my ex knew that that was 100 percent my life you know horror films and writing about them and stuff and so we had to do this big court battle and so i get to court and this will be a cliff notes version uh i get to court and i have like letters from like really great friends in the horror community talking about how horror is so beneficial and allows parents to talk about different topics, you know, through the lens of genre films. You know, I had uh, my friend Sean Keller, I had AJ Bowen, I had all these people speak up on my behalf to say, hey, dude, like what he's doing to his kid's life is actually great. 
you know, and it was never like a forceful thing. It was just like my 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 oldest really loved horror films. You know, it's not like I was showing them like Martyrs or a Serbian film, but like, hey, you want to watch the new Carrie remake? Let's do it. So basically, I get there, and I live in a very conservative town, which is awful because I'm I'm very liberal. Uh, and I get there, and the judge was just like, "These movies are evil." Uh, and so we're going to give temporary custody to your ex 100 with no, no reason whatsoever. So I walked out of that courthouse, just devastated. Like seriously, like I was in tears. It was still to this day, one of the hardest days of my life. And I checked my email that I had quickly skimmed through that morning because I was on my way to court. And I had my email from Rebecca McKendry saying, do you want to come into L.A. two and a half hours away to help Fango with the screen of Joyride 3? And I I walked out of the courthouse in tears and I I said into the air some a a mantra that has been like my mantra since is fuck it. And I got in my car directly from the courthouse, drove to L.A., an emotional mess. So I get to the Cine Family Theater which is like this the theater in L.A. that's really great. And then we were doing the special screening. You know, uh, Rebecca McKendry handed me, you know, issues of Fangoria, the new relaunch issues of Gore Zone to hand out to people that wanted to come to the screening. You know, like it was such a fun time during, uh, you know, one of the worst days of my life. And what made me laugh so hard was I was at just at my worst that day because, you know, for a while I didn't get to see my oldest just because they liked the Carrie remake, like something as simple as that. And so I was handing out issues of Fangoria and I was handing out issues of Gore Zone and nobody from the actual production cast or crew showed up. Really? I think there were maybe 14 people that showed up. Oh wow! And okay. no, even even McKendry, even Becca, like left. I think before the movie started. <laughs> so, for people that don't know, for an event like this, what would be typical? I mean, obviously, you would expect maybe someone that was like intimately involved in the production to be there. But what would the turnout be for something like? Well, that? I mean, I I also. Uh... I think I don't remember if it was before or after this, but I helped uh, rep Fango at a, a screening of this movie called *The Possession of Michael King*, and there were tons of people at that screening. Uh, I think I believe it was at the New Bev Theater, uh, the New Beverly, and I mean the whole cast, the crew showed up. Typically, the things that Fango would would throw, they'd have huge turnouts. Mm-hmm. But there was, I think, there was a couple factors in this one. One, it was *Joyride 3*. Two, the same day that we had the special screening premiere, it also premiered on Redbox. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, and so no one showed up, and there was like a a kind of like producer guy that had nothing to do with the movie, and a like horror community like actress that showed up, and they're like, "Well, where's Declan, the director? And like, where's this person?" I go, "I have no idea, but do you want an issue of Gore Zone?" And they looked at me like, who is this motherfucker? Like, they were so pissed that they took off. And really? so, like, I was, yeah, I was having so the you worst were day. you driving people away. Dude, totally. So I was having the worst day ever. And I sat in these, like, nice chairs and this, or this nice little couch at that theater. And I watched Joyride 3. And to this day, it was one of the, like, the most, not exhilarating, but I had so much fun in that theatrical screening of this movie that knew exactly what it was. You know, I think that's my big issue with Joyride 2 is that it tries to be something more than it is. It doesn't have faith in the kind of movie it is. Joyride 3, on the other end, it knows it's a silly direct-to-video sequel, so it has fun with being just that. And I don't mean that to downplay it. And it's a silly sequel to, you know, a pulpy B-movie to begin with. Exactly. So I walked out of that movie just thinking like, man, that was so much fun. And it was that night that I realized something about myself. And that was that I just do not, I sincerely just do not believe in guilty pleasures. Mm -hmm. If something brings you enjoyment and entertainment, love what you love. Right. I I remember like emailing Rebecca McKendry when I got home that night, like super late. And hey, dude, thank you so much for, you know, asking me to help rep Fango for this one. She's like, wait, what? And I go, oh, I love that movie. She's like, wait, what? (laughs) <laughs> and then she fired you. No, right? And then then Fango went down the drain. No, I'm just kidding. Right. Uh, 
Uh, no, but like I, I love Joyride three. It's nothing more than a silly sequel to a movie. And and I said this in the last episode, but this one especially. I remember sitting there in the theater, being overwhelmed by the court stuff, watching the credits, knowing what kind of shit show I was about to watch in a good way, and then seeing characters created by J.J. Abrams on the screen, just knowing that. And laughing, like, out loud, like, there's no way that J.J. Abrams is stoked to have his name in the credits of this movie. Right. He was kind of like a Lawnmower Man 2 deal, where he, oh, like, Lord. where Stephen King, like, actively sued to get his name taken off the print. It's like, stop associating me with these movies, damn it. I was young. Needed the money. What's funny uh, is I I think Stephen King even tried to do that with the first Lawnmower Man. That's true. Okay. That's what it was. <laughs> No, but to your point, like, there's, we've always approached this show from the perspective, I think with the one exception being the second Lost Boys movie, where I think list, a couple listeners even called us out, like, dude, you kind of bumming us out with this this one, man. Like, yeah. Um, we've always tried to, tried to take the perspective that this movie, even if it's not our favorite, this is someone's favorite movie out there. Like, someone out there has a Buster Rhymes from Halloween Resurrection tattoo and can quote that movie. That person might be Ryan Larson, who was the guest on that show. You're right. Um, you know? But that... Um, you know somebody started writing somebody started writing romance novels just because of L.O. Cool J's character yeah, in H2O. You know? Um, so we've always tried to take that perspective... Uh, and I, there shouldn't I, be guilty pleasures. That, no, like, there shouldn't. As long as what you're enjoying isn't hurting someone. Like if, like what I really love to do is go out and like set ducks on fire. Well, that would be a guilty. Pleasure. Maybe not that. Please don't do that. You know. But, I think that know. there's this uh, this common misconception, especially I've experienced it on Twitter this week. I, I I was going through my feed that and Facebook, and I was seeing like so much just negativity lately, even more than usual. And it made I tweeted something along the lines of I'm paraphrasing myself, but along the lines of like, do any of you people who talk about how much you love movies actually love movies? Because all mm-hmm. it is a snark, you know. E- yeah. Everyone just hates stuff. And there was a few people that got pissed about that, saying that like, no, you know, there's nothing wrong with not liking a movie. You know, uh, you know, not everything has to be loved. And it's like I, I'm not saying it does, but what I'm saying is there are plenty of movies that I hate with a passion. But I don't spend my time like actively telling people they're wrong, actively calling out the movies and their filmmakers because I don't like them. I just mm. don't like them, you know. Like I and that's something that I've really tried to bring to my part of the show. That even if the movies, there are movies that I just don't like that we have covered. I mean, the first right. series we did was the Scream series, and that's like probably one of my least favorite franchises ever. But I what like I, that. I still don't get it. You know, I, I since I try once a year to revisit them, and you know, I'm genuinely hoping that one day I revisit them. And I'm like, you know what, they mm-hmm. work for me now. But like that being said, I've tried to approach every episode with respect for the movies themselves, even if they're not what I'm into. You know, right? Yeah, and that's the. Joy in the curse of like doing a show with this format is every franchise we do tends to have like one movie that I think we're going to love. You know what I mean? Like it's usually the first movie in the series, but then depending on what you're doing, it can kind of go downhill really quickly. Yeah, I mean, we're we're about to cover the Nightmare on Elm Street series, and I think there's a good solid two, maybe three, but mostly two films in that series that I just do not like, Mm -hmm. you know? But, like, I I do feel like that's one great thing about our show is, like you said and like I said, I I do feel like there's a reverence towards each film. I mean, that – and it takes a lot of people to make a movie. I'm not going to just trash a movie just because I don't like it. At the same time – I may not like Dream Warriors very much, but there is such a huge following for that movie. Who am I to tell people that they're wrong for liking something? So we don't record video for this show, but if you could have seen my face when you just said, I don't like Dream Warriors very much. That's my daughter's favorite movie. Not favorite horror movie, not favorite Elm Street movie. Just in general? Flat out, like, her favorite movie right now is, and it'll change, of course, but... Um, her favorite movie is A Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. That is so cool. I think yeah. that's my son's favorite one, too. It's so good. Um, 
you know, and for me, like when we get to the Elm Street series, like that is my where Halloween is like your baby and Friday the 13th is your baby. Um, the Elm Street series for me is the one that I'm so jacked up to do, like even oh. more than the Alien movies. Man, um, I'm so excited. You know, because that like I and it's and I was trying I was actually like literally before we hit record just thinking like why is that? Because it's not like it was the first of the big franchise movies that I saw. Like that goes to like, Halloween two, uh, which used to play in repeat uh, every Halloween when I was a little kid. It would be on Channel fifty six in Boston, like mm-hmm. literally every night leading up to Halloween. So I know I had seen that probably at you know the TV version a half dozen times before. Um, ever seeing an Elm Street movie, but I remember um, Freddy's Revenge, like that was the first one I saw literally hiding behind my friend's sofa when it played on like HBO or Cinemax one afternoon after school and being blown away by it. And mm-hmm. at the age where I was like, I wasn't old enough to understand the subtext of the movie, but I was old enough to understand why, you know, Freddy Krueger was like so cru- cool and so so gro- uh so um iconic at that point no totally i i had some amazon credits and and whenever i have amazon credit i'm like you know i, I might as well just spend it all you know mm-hmm. so uh last or yesterday or the day before i can't remember which one i was like oh you know that that playstation uh game man eater where you're a shark mm-hmm. eating people was on, like on sale for like 20 bucks I'm like okay i'm getting that and then i realized that we're about to tackle the elm street movie so i was like oh the complete series is 19 dollars. <laughs> obviously i need to grab that too so no i'm I'm super excited to do this yeah well that and we'll get later on into our patreon how you can support us and help jerry and myself <laughs> procure these movies uh but we won't do that yet okay so Jerry, why don't you do the honors and set up Wrong Turn 3? I, I, you know, we usually don't do plot synopsis in these shows. We figure people have seen them and it's not like we're definitely not and never will be. A, and then this happened and then this happened yeah. and then this happened podcast. Um, but why don't you give a quick rundown of um, what goes on in Joyride 3? Because I don't think it's a movie that I think let's put it this way. More people will probably listen to the show that have like seen the movie. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. Uh, That's Joy... a little arrogant, but you know. I need no, to... no, we've had we've had people tweet at us basically saying that. Uh, now, like uh, Joyride Three is directed by Declan O'Brien, who also directed Wrong Turn Three, Four, and Five, and The Marine Three. So we know what we're getting into. Uh, you know, it, it, the main star of it is Jesse Hutch, which is really funny because both Jesse Hutch and Ken Kersinger who plays Rusty Nelson in this movie, were both in Freddy vs. Jason together, so it's kind of like a reunion. Basically, what Wrong Turn 3 is, it's about a group of uh, kind of like NASCAR-esque racers who are on like a road trip to go from Kansas to Canada to take part in this uh, big race. You know, you have the, the, the driver, the mechanic, you know, the social media people, manager. They're all going on this thing. There's about seven or eight people going on this road trip. And like most movies like this, they stop at a diner. They ask advice like, hey, there's this Route 17 on the map, but it's not on GPS. And you have this kind of like conspiracy theorist, like wacko guy, basically tell him, don't go down there. It's Slaughter Alley. But also government conspiracies and aliens. So they don't take him seriously because, I mean, they shun it. He's he's out there. They go on it anyways. And that happens to be the area where Rusty Nell's from the fir- uh, Rusty Nell from the first one and the second one likes to terrorize people. So what you get is like the first and second movie, the race the racer group in this one kind of mess with Rusty. You know, they like cut him off. They get like gravel thrown into his truck and they're they basically mess with them and that sets them off. And what you get after that you don't get the same as the first one where it's like this very intense thriller, you know, kind of B-ish movie about Rusty getting revenge or you don't get this like hostile like super downer movie like the second one what you get is something more in lines with like a Friday the 13th or a hatchet film Rusty in this film is played by Ken Kersinger who played Jason Freddy versus Jason and the difference between this movie and the first two is that you finally get a full-on character from Rusty you know, yeah. I think I th- you, I think Ted Levine is so good in the first one, his voice, and uh, oh god, what was his name in the second one? 
I don't want to be disrespectful for the actor, but uh, whatever actor played him in the second one, I'm sorry, I'll think of it in a little bit. But Ken Kersinger in this movie, the, like after seeing this, I would have loved to see him play Rusty Nell in a whole franchise because you get this big personality, the Southern drawl who likes to like talk shit to his victims and one-liners and you know say quotes from the Bible before he throws a dude's face into like an engine. Like, it's such a big character that's fully fleshed out, which is really weird because when you get to, like, direct-to-video sequels, you usually get the opposite. But basically, he goes after each of the team members one by one, and you get some of the most inventive slasher kills in a good while. I mean, you, he, like, puts a guy's hand into a, a motor while saying, you know, like, idle hands are the devil's plaything. <laughs> And then puts his face in, or he like he one of the guys he puts against a barrel and puts chains around him and tightens him until he's mush. Like it's a silly movie, and it knows it's being silly, and it it just revels in that fact. And basically, they have to escape, and you get some of the biggest action sequences in straight to video, direct to video sequels that you see. I mean, the editing's great, the music's great, it's fun. We talked a bit about, I'm sorry to jump in. No, no. We go. talked a bit when we talked about Joyride too. like, why was this movie four by three, you know, in 2008 and kind of how cheap it looked overall. Um, this movie looked gorgeous. Yeah. Like it's shot really well. It really, like I was watching it on the projection system I have at home and it really popped like all the colors on it popped to the point where it's almost like for it direct-to-video kind of knockoff movie. Like, this could have been, like, reference quality, like, show off a real system. Um, look to it overall. Look, it looks beautiful. I think that's what made that first experience so special to me, is the first time I saw this movie wasn't on DVD or wasn't on Blu-ray or Redbox or anything. I saw it at a nice theater in Los Angeles on the big screen, you know? And it does look gorgeous. Like, you, you see all these direct-to-video movies... And it just seems like, oh, we have a title, we're going to throw a couple bucks at the screen, and there you go, there's a movie. This movie, you can tell every single person worked their asses off to give fans of the first two movies like an experience that maybe they wouldn't have expected. Because, you know, I mean, let's be honest, what you see with Joyride 2 and 3 is the $5 bin at Walmart, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, rightfully so in some ways, but at the same time... I mean, I can only imagine someone coming across this at Walmart or Target or one of those those places, picking it up, expecting something, you know, completely silly. And it is. But seeing this movie and being like, wow, that score is really tense. You know, like mm -hmm. the action. Wow. The editing in this movie. Like there's, there's a scene where Rusty, right when the racers kind of cut him off and they have the, like their race car and they also have like the little truck with a with a little uh i don't even know what to say but a truck following them too and rusty goes after both of them and you have this really neat uh just very tight uh, like like really great edited scene sequence where rusty's kind of like trying to run them off the road and it feels like something that would have been in a fast and furious movie as far as quality with that action sequence like they really take the time to just put you on a ride again which i think was kind of in the first one like it wasn't action super actiony but like it gave you an experience and the second film was such a step back for me to see in this movie it's like you know it made me like excited to go on a ride with with that character again because I mean, the second film, like, I just don't like Rusty in that movie, you know? And you're not right. supposed to like him, but I, I think that this is the one movie of Ken Kersinger's career thus far where he was giving given an opportunity to actually be a full-on character. It wasn't just, you know what I mean? He gets to be more than, like, a stuntman wearing a mask in this movie. And if you look at, like, his credits, I mean, he has over a hundred credits to his name as being a stunt person so obviously he's been extremely successful in doing that um but he hasn't really been given a lot to do in terms of you know really getting to play a character he owns you know? the character too and yeah he is really good in this movie and 
You know, it's it. I think like Kurt, he Ken Kurzinger's best known as being the not Kane hotter Jason in Freddy versus Jason, mm-hmm. um, and he'll kind of all be kind of forever tied to that. And I remember when we were kind of researching Freddy versus Jason, you know, knowing how upset Kane Hodder was that he didn't get to play the role, and it's like, oh, now it's just a big stunt guy holding a machete, wearing a mask, and. Here he's got, I mean, I don't want to say like real range. I mean, it's obviously, it's a, <laughs> but like he takes that space and he really fills it. He's got this great physical presence to him and he brings this kind of manic glee to the character of Rusty Nails. It makes it like really fun to watch. Oh yeah, definitely. And he gives these long monologues right before the death like, scenes. And mm-hmm. you can tell that Ken Kersinger just had so much fun in this movie giving those because they're so just pretentious and silly. Right. You know, like, they're they're just over the top, these monologues. But you can tell that he's not taking it, like, to the extreme. You know, like, he's actually, like, having fun making this movie. And don't get me wrong. Like, I talk about this movie being very silly and fun. It is still dark as fuck like, right. it is bleak it is a mean-spirited movie especially the opening sequence which i mean i think would be great to talk about but that being said let's do that yeah, yeah, moment. let's sure. jump to that sure so the opening sequence to this movie feels a little bit out of place with the rest of the movie and it feels like okay we have an 80 minute movie we need like a seven to ten minute long um sequence that's going to roll before the credits and it starts with these two meth heads in a motel room, like a dingy motel room. And I think like the very first shot of the movie is a woman like pulling hits off like a crack pipe. Yeah. Basically it's these two drug addicts that are in this motel room who can't even have sex without hitting the crack pipe. Right. And in the middle of, uh, in the middle of like having sex, you know, she's like, no, I need another bump basically. And they, they, they're like very cliche drug addicts in film. And yeah. it, that's, it's the, it's the one part of the movie that just fundamentally bothers me because, you know, I've been very open about my past with substance abuse, mm-hmm. you know, years ago. And as a recovering addict myself, I really don't like feel, I, I don't like feeling like movies are super exploitative over addiction and that kind of stuff. And this opening right. sequence definitely is. Basic- it's very <laughs> To me, it felt like, I think I put this in the brief notes I wrote, was like, it was like the producer said, Breaking Bad is a hit right now. So can we include like method, you know, meth heads in a scene right now? Can we do that in the movie? It feels like it was added on very late to the process. Um, saying we need to pad the movie a bit. And I don't know, meth is big right now. So do something with that. Exactly. They get this idea. <laughs> it's such a random ass scene. They get this idea because they're all out of meth to use a nearby walkie talkie, which I don't know why they have it in the hotel room. Uh, yep. They get this walkie talkie and they have this idea to lure a truck driver to their motel to rob beat up and steal their money to buy more meth. And naturally the one person that picks up is rusty now. And they kind of like the first film, they lure him to the motel to, you know, basically, you know, the first movie was more of a prank, but this one's like full on rob him. And the moment they open the door, rusty just like handles his business, like chokes out the dude. And then suddenly it fades into the reality of the situation, which is, Rusty used these chains with like I think the 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 rotor or something like that on the on the big rig. They're tied, yeah. They're tied to some sort of rotor. <laughs> if they touch it, they're screwed. Yes, basically, if one of them falls, he's gonna drive him down a mile of Route 17 while they're attached to the front of the rig uh, with a big bag, a massive bag of meth, scotch taped or or they're just taped to the window. Basically, if they get to the end of the mile without f- pulling each other or themselves under the truck, they'll get a whole bag of meth. And they and it is a we cannot stress enough. It is a big bag of meth. Oh, it is huge. Anyone who has ever bought drugs knows, man, Rusty must have some coin for that. That's a lot of. Meth. It's a lot. But uh, so they get and you know what's weird is you get these like very cliche drug addict in film caricatures for the most part at the beginning of the motel. 
But once they're going full speed on the big rig and they have to get through that mile, suddenly there's like enduring qualities about them. You're sympathetic. To you it. are. Like the guy in particular is like trying to really hold on and have his like girlfriend hold on for dear, partly for his own survival, but partly like he's trying to talk her through it. Yeah. And it's a great stunt, like on its own, like these two people that are like chained to the side of this uh rig as it's like barreling down an empty stretch of highway like it's a great stunt oh totally it's definitely like that first sequence is more ambitious than like anything in the second no uh, definitely and you know he's looking at her in the eyes and he's crying and she's crying he's like baby it's okay look into my eyes and you're like what this is so what do you see <laughs> Basically, like, it's so different than the first ten minutes of these characters. And they get to the end of the mile, and Rusty's almost thinking about letting them go. And the girl sees the bag of meth, and suddenly she gets this, like, Cheshire cat grin on her face. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, please do Wait till we stop the car, please. <laughs> it's like when you go to dinner, and there's, like, say, like, it's a bunch of you out to dinner, and all the food comes, and one person doesn't have their food, and... You know that it's polite to wait until everybody has their food before you eat, but you gotta dig into that like chicken pot pie. So yeah, you can. You see that? You see that baked potato with those chives and that sour cream, and you're like, I do not want this to go cold. I need it now. Right. And so she has a smile, and the dude knows what's about to happen. He knows he's just absolutely fucked, and she basically reaches for the meth. And the boyfriend goes under the the rig, and she goes under the rig, and it is like straight out of that scene in Devil's Rejects where the whole highway is filled with body parts and splattered blood. And that is this that is basically a jumping off point of what you're about to get into. It is a it's a splatter film. Yeah, and I love how when later on when it's being investigated, the one cop is like, "Well, it could be coyotes," and it's like these like body parts are strewn they've got like tire tracks on them there's like road rash on them it's like oh you know maybe it was rabid chipmunks or something that like eviscerated these people into a solid chunks that are like going straight down the highway there's uh, yeah totally and that's an interesting subplot because the police in the first film they kind of feel like when you watch that, you kind of know, like, hey, they kind of know what's going on, and they want to get to the bottom of it. Whereas this film, there's a subplot with a young, new police officer at the crime scene trying to figure out what's going on, and an older, kind of weathered police officer going, no, nope, let's just, let's not even worry about it. I don't want to deal with it. And so you get kind of this weird subplot where there's this young cop trying to figure out what's going on, and it leads to this really cool sequence uh, towards the middle of the film where Rusty basically frames another truck driver for murdering one of the kids. And you get this really great homage to the first film where Rusty just barrels right through another truck with wow. his car. And that's another thing that, like, speaking on the action of this movie, this movie shot like a bigger movie. Like, I could totally see this plane in theaters. So it's really crazy that this is the third movie when the second film very much felt like a direct video entry. When we talked about the first movie, I think we mentioned the budget was somewhere around 16 million. And I'm like, how did this movie cost $16 million? Because like, there's a couple stunts, but not like a tremendous amount of them. Um, there's really no like huge, like at that point, Paul Walker's not a really big name. Uh, Lili Sobieski is not a huge name. Steve Zahn is, you know, he's doing whatever Sean William Scott turns down. So he's not really a huge name. <laughs> to me, I'm like, why is it, you know, why did that cost $16 million? Where if you told me that's what this one cost, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Like every dollar ended up on screen in this one. And you can tell because, I mean, not to offend any of the actors involved, like, if you're not, like, a genre fan, you're not going to be like, oh, man, that was the dude that got killed in the bed in Freddy vs. Jason, you know what I mean? Like, like there's no recognizable actors. Right. They, they do a great job. Uh, uh, they're, unlike the second film, like, I actually like most of the performances in this movie. But I feel mm -hmm. like every dollar that the production company had with this one, they made sure it went up on screen, and it shows. Uh, I, I think that what's – another reason that I, I really like 
uh, this movie, and it goes back to the first film, and I guess in some ways the second one, is a common theme that runs through every film in the series is kind of the film's protagonist having such arrogance. Like, they always have so many opportunities to not go head-to-head with Rusty, but it, it kind of feels like these movies are jackass gone wrong. You know, it's like people playing pranks on the wrong person and it blows up on their face, in their face. I would say in this case, they were targeted for the slightest of reasons, though. Like, first movie, they prank him to the point where he's, like, heading out in the middle of a thunderstorm, knocking on some stranger's door in a hotel, Mm -hmm. and who knows what can go wrong there. Second movie, like, these people steal his car. Um, This movie, like, they cut him (laughs) off on the highway. Yeah, Like, that's literally the instigating incident is one of the characters, like, cuts him off on the highway. I think what's interesting, though, is... We're giving as viewers, we're given more information about them being dicks than Rusty even is, but he's going after yeah. them. Like we hear the conversations in the car, like, well, just trying to wake him up. <laughs> you know, Rusty doesn't hear that stuff. But yeah, the smallest thing, the smallest little prank or smallest little thing, like it sets him off, not even a small way. Like Joyride 3 is definitely like Rusty Nail going big or going home. Like he mm-hmm. I think he's to the point in his his just maliciousness. That, like, there's such, I don't know, such pleasure in, in, like, just terrorizing these people in this one. Yes. If there was a tagline for this movie, it would be, well, that escalated quickly. Like, that would be the tagline for this movie. It escalates quickly. I was just going to say that, like, what set this movie apart for me in kind of a negative way uh, in some ways uh, in the first film, you were given three leads to follow, three characters, you know? In the, in the second film, you, you have four characters, basically. I think one of the downsides of this movie, though, is that you're given, like, seven or eight protagonists to follow to where, like, it really pushes forth the realization that this is not a suspense movie anymore. This is a body count slasher movie that feels like Friday the 13th. It feels like Halloween. It feels right. like those – it definitely feels kind of like more of a hatchet kind right. of movie to where it's like, you know what? Let's give Gorehounds some really fun kills – and, and that's 100% what this movie is. The uh, first wrong turn movie, like, all three of your protagonists survive. And the one of the protagonists, like, best friend survives. Like, there's no real body count in that movie. Um, second movie, like, two of the four characters die in that movie. And then there's, like, one ran- random kill midway through. Like, they're not body count movies. This one is, like from the 30 minute point on like the bodies start dropping in really hilarious and grotesque ways yes talk about that i always uh kind of compare joyride 3 with wrong turn 2 because they they feel and especially since i feel like the first wrong turn film uh is more in line with the first joyride film as far as being a more suspenseful you know, movie. Yeah, there's there's more kills in Wrong Turn, but it's it's more of a kind of thriller esque kind of film. Whereas Wrong Turn Two definitely embraced the slasher vibes and the kind of modern day video nasty and just gore hound. You know, just all the blood up on the screen, and that's what this movie is. It's definitely a departure from the original, but I feel like Declan O'Brien with this movie, just like Joe Lynch with Wrong Turn Two, said, you know what? This is going direct to video. I don't have to worry about the ratings board. So let's just amplify everything that the, you know, like really like slasher, just gore hounds would just love to see. Let's give them a splatter movie. Let's give them something that we don't get to see very often. And it's not a splatter movie in in the same way as, say, a Tourista's or a Hostel or something like that. Where it's just like, how mean can we be to people, right. and let's be super cynical. It's it's like, it's like Friday Thirteenth Seven in a lot of ways. I think you know, it, it feels like here's a group of people, you know, they all have different identities, but we know they're basically cannon fodder. You know, we we. And I think that to your point earlier with like the larger cast and them being indistinguishable, I think one of the things that made it hard is like it's basically four white dudes. And two of them look really similar. Aside from your lead, they all kind of have the same mannerisms and the same outlook. You know, there's really nothing that differentiates them. You know, maybe the one dude who's really into Large Marge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. 
like that I remember. <laughs> but by and large, it's kind of hard to tell them apart. And then you have like your two um, female characters, and like one is blonde and one is brunette, and that's honest to god, like that's their characterization. Yeah, they're 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 only. There are only, I think, two characters that really stand out as far as the protagonists or the leads in this movie. It's it's mm-hmm. the main character that Jesse Jesse Hutch from Freddy vs. Jason plays, and it's the one that I think you were talking about. Uh, I think his name's Austin in the film. He has mm-hmm. the white leather jacket, the longer hair. He's kind of the racer that you know he didn't it didn't work out for him because it's everybody else's fault, and he's the one that like right. fucks with Rusty at the beginning. He's kind of the one like he has such a personality. That I feel like he's everything that they tried to do with that character in the second movie with the you know the MySpace guy, mm-hmm. you know like he's he's kind of like the black sheep of the group because everyone else is so vanilla as far as personality right. that this guy you know he has to be the asshole of the group and that actually makes him more memorable in this movie in a good way. And he's far less I think annoying than um, Nick in Wrong Turn Two. Oh, you know definitely. he's annoying. But he's, like, far, far less annoying overall. What's funny is that guy's one of the first people to go in this movie. Yes, he is. Like, you get a character that's actually, like, a pretty good, a pretty good written, like, stereotypical dickhead that's actually fun to watch. And he's the one that, like, Rusty, right, I think the he might be the first kill other than the, the meth uh, users. Whereas, yeah, like, Rusty you're right. gets pissed at him that he's the one that ran him off the road or tried to cuts both of his hands off at the motor and then shoves his face in and throws him on the ground. And it's like, after that, you're like, whoa, that was the one character that's really written kind of well. But then you get Jesse Hutch's character who, I mean, for all intents and purposes, like he just wants to get to his race, you know, like he even tells the, the Austin Mm -hmm. guy that's starting on his trouble. Like, Hey, I just want to get to the race. If I get a mark on my driving record, they're not going to let me race. And you know, and right. He does his best. I, I think he's kind of the Paul Walker character of of this movie you know like he's he's a part of the mischief but you know he regrets what's going on he tries to do his best and that leads to like that leads to this one of my favorite showdowns in like these kind of movies in a while the end showdown in this movie is so just it feels so much bigger than the movie actually is right it takes place in a pretty it's almost like a what would you call it? like a giant truck stop or it's kind of like a, a cross um, between a truck stop and kind of like a uh, junkyard junkyard yeah 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 basically uh the main character jesse hutch's character like he's in like this big tractor and he's trying to like crush rusty nell and save his friend and he there's one death in this movie and i feel bad because i love this movie so much but i don't even remember the character's name i, I think it's bobby actually He's the one that is against the barrel, and he gets squished with these chains until he's mush. That is so messed up. Yeah, it, so basically, imagine a bondage suit made of, like, heavy link uh, heavy link chains. And it's, like, all over his face. It's encapsulating his whole body. And it is, like basically tied to a wench and then the and you have that wench going as fast as it can to kind of pull itself in and it just like it starts smoking and it just crushes him and he's screaming and blood is flying and you're like it's just like it's an awful way to go but it's so funny that at the same that time. and what's because it's so ridiculous what's really funny to me and in in that that's the one moment where jesse hutch's character the main character switches gears so much he goes from like like i was saying the kind of nice guy that feels bad about everything but the moment bobby dies with the chains he gets this big Mm -hmm. like rage filled like come at me bro mentality and he just starts yelling obscenities at rusty and the entire movie he's so just angry like he's hopped up on like 14 four locos and uh, some meth himself and he's just like it's it's he goes from like Basically, John Rambo in First Blood to, like, John Rambo in Rambo 3. It's such a switch that it almost feels disjointed at times. But if you're having fun watching Joyride 3, you have to laugh at, like, that personality shift so much. Because that actor, Jesse Hutch, he has so much fun with with kind of switching gears and being, like, that typical bro trying to fight this, like, maniacal truck driver. Yeah, but it makes sense you would make that switch. I mean, you know that, like, 
one of your friends or crew members has already been killed. Your best friend has basically been crushed to death. And your girlfriend is in mortal peril as well. And at that point, like, what do you have to lose? You know what oh, I mean? Oh, no, totally. Like, you can see why. Like, it's a man who's been pushed, like, as far as he can possibly be pushed and just doesn't give any shits anymore. I think what I find funny about it is that we never get, like, a uh, a Travis Bickle or a... Uh, Michael a, Douglas a type falling of... down. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, well, Jesse Hutch's character isn't as much of a, like woe is me white man as much as those two Mm -hmm. characters that we said but like just as an example there's kind of a arc of them losing their shit and what makes joyride 3 so funny to me is you get this very passive character and then after that death happens it goes like before and after it's like before steroids and after you know like it, it's it's like it's like a serum turned him into the Hulk out of nowhere, and it, it's so much fun to watch. You know, to me, what's interesting about these movies is how each of them is a little reflection of where horror was at at that time. Mm-hmm. The first movie comes at the tail end of, you know, it's in two thousand one, and I think there's a lot of that late nineties optimism in that movie. Um, it came out in October, so a month after September 11th, but you know, it was obviously conceived and shot and um, ready to go like before that occurred. And you have this sense of optimism that's in that movie. And it was at a time when horror movies had maybe more of a focus on being fun than being scary. Like what was really big at that point were teen slasher movies with really beautiful casts and it was less about trying to scare your audience and more about like let's provide a good time and you see that in the first joyride movie um the point is like no death count no body count in it it's not bloody it's not gory at all um it's more like let's make a fun b movie for kids second movie comes out mid 2000s you are at a point where the country is like in two wars, the economy is collapsing. You are coming at the tail end of the Bush era where you just feel like shitty about what is going on in the country at that point. And the horror of the time reflected it where what was big, like your Rob Zombies, your um, Eli Roth movies, where it is and even like foreign horror at that time. Like that's the years that Martyrs comes out. Like you're at peak French extreme horror at that point. Uh, the Lake comes out. Uh, sorry, Eden Lake comes out in Britain, which is another. That might be a Patreon yeah. episode one day because that is a oh, fucking Lord, grim, yeah. dark. Is that a Fassbender movie? I think that might be like yeah, one yeah, of Fassbender's Michael Fassbender early definitely. World. So before he was like fingering himself in Covenant, like he was getting the <laughs> shit kicked out of him by a bunch of hoodlums and hoodies. Um, and then this movie kind of like stra- straddles that middle ground where it's a pretty divided time in 2014 you have um a country kind of pulling itself apart a little bit but things are also not terrible like you've got a slow economic recovery um you're at a point where you're feeling a little bit better about things and you could have some fun again but overall like you probably have a dark streak going on and I'm trying to think of like what the big horror movies of 2013, 2014 were. And I think at that point we're kind of in the middle of the found footage craze, if I'm correct. Yeah, uh, what we had during that time was a lot of found footage or found footage-esque films. I mean, I mentioned that Fangoria screen of the possession of Michael King. You know, that was another one that was very much like that. You know, a man's wife dies and he basically wants to defy every religion and every demon. So he tries to conjure every one of them while filming himself that, uh, as above, so below, uh, I think that's the name of it, that, or all the paranormal activity moves, that stuff you have those, but also even more underground, you had, uh, these series that would go on and on and on with direct to video because they sold well, you know, Declan O'Brien, like I said, directed three of the wrong turn Mm -hmm. movies around that same time. Almost as regular as the Saw movies were in the early 2000s, during this time, it was like you knew every year you'd get another wrong turn. And I think Joyride tried to start that with this series, with this movie especially. Mm -hmm. It just for some reason didn't happen. But even like what you were talking about 
with it being a reflection of where we were at. The second film, it was definitely a reaction to that time where we'd see news things about people getting beheaded in the Middle East, you know, yeah. that were hostages. You know, it was a very, I think all of that torture-esque, like, films, you know, with the, the, the torture porn label was kind of a reaction to the violence that was in our eyes, whether it's media or just real life, 24-7. And I think by this film... It was a time in horror where, yeah, found footage was definitely taken over. But I also feel like during that time, it was kind of re a revitalization of the genre itself. I mean, we'd also get like, you know, a couple years before or after, you know, we'd get films by Benson and Moorhead. We'd get the VHS series that showcased so many different directors. We'd get The Guest. We'd get Your Next. You're getting, you know, we'd, we'd, Duplass's Creep mm -hmm. comes yes. up this year. Another like pretty voyeuristic movie where you just feel like you can't turn away the babadook comes out in 2014 as well and you get like i said we're in the middle of these found footage movies but you're getting something that is a little bit different than your typical um why are they filming this right now there's no point to it um or what you come to expect unfriended the first unfriended movie yeah. is released that year which shows some real innovations with the genre overall so you're getting at a point now and we're kind of pre-streaming like where companies like netflix and hulu and amazon would start investing tens of millions of dollars in anything they could scoop up for content at that point um, but you, so you're seeing some real innovation with these smaller indie movies and in showing what can be done. That, and we're getting like during that time that this came out and the year kind of before and after, we started getting a return to escapism in genre films. We'd have the very serious, socially, you know, relevant films like The Babadook and things like that, but we'd also get like films that kind of helped with escapism in every subgenre of horror. Like you, you mentioned unfriended. Like I remember seeing that at Fantasia mm -hmm. when it was called cybernatural. Same. Same. And I was like, God, I love that Wait, movie. Were you there? Or I, and I, I covered it remotely. Okay, I thought maybe with the same reading. Uh, right. Uh, that, or I think it might've been that year that I saw what has, what instantly became one of my favorite films of all time. And that's Nicholas McCarthy's at the devil's door. Uh, which, I mean, God, I would recommend seeing that movie and, you know, kind of bummed about the whole Naya Rivera thing because she was in that film. You know, that's mm -hmm. definitely a tragedy. But, like, during that time, you would get escapism in every subgenre of horror, whereas in the early th 2000s, it was, like, basically, like, the 70s reaction to Vietnam, you know, with, like, Hills Have Eyes, not Hills Have Eyes, but, like, uh, Last House on the Left or Texas Chainsaw Massacre. It was kind of, like everything shoved in people's faces and in the early 2000s with the torture stuff and especially the fringe extreme stuff it was like kind of putting violence in our eyes to make us ad like finally address everything going on in our world whereas the era that joyride 3 came out we'd have those movies but at the same point again like it was such a time for escapism in every single subgenre, and I feel like that's what Joyride 3 perfectly played into, that escapism of just a fun time of watching a silly body count film. Yeah, and sometimes you need that. Sometimes you need the ability to just kind of turn your brain off for 90 minutes and giggle at somebody having like their hands shoved through like a fast moving <laughs> fan blade while their killer quotes Bible verses incorrectly. You know, I mean, sometimes right. you need that in a movie. Um, well, I think, I think there's this thing on social media, especially, and it's always like so fascinating to me that I think in this day and age, especially on social media, definitely Twitter, where every film has to be either the greatest or the worst film ever made. Correct, nothing in between. And there's so many movies that are either just okay or, like, just there. Like, this movie, Joyride 3 is definitely not the best movie ever right. made. It's even not even that spectacular. But what it is, it's fun. It's, it's a fun movie to put on when you want to have pizza and a beer and laugh with your friends about the absurdity of this film. It's it's, and I don't mean that in like a Miami connection or you know that Greasy kind of way. Or, like, yeah, it's not like exactly. Yeah. It's it's not that. It's, it's not just a like school for a parody. Exactly. I remember when I was a kid; those were my favorite things to do: is invite friends over for the weekend, 
and just rent five movies for five dollars for five days Mm -hmm. and just watch all of them that night and just have like you know those those bottle shaped plastic bottles of kool-aid and like gushers you know like and pizza yeah like that's what joyride 3 is it's a return to those kind of movies it's a return to dr giggles we used it's a to, it's a re- we mm-hmm. used to i used to host in boston um from 2010 to 2015 i hosted a independent horror movie night every month at a the independent theater just outside of boston it was a little screening room like i had like a 120 inch screen and about like 35 seats or so um and i got it for like a hundred bucks um to rent the room as he gave me a great deal on it just because like everybody that came to the screenings tended to like drink and eat a lot so they more than made up their money and you know so we were doing that for five years and we would show like richard mark griffin who's a uh, filmmaker out of providence rhode island who has done like a few dozen movies uh and he would make these like vintage kind of like 70s exploitation throwback movies like the disco exorcist which is literally oh, i remember that it's such a fun and that was like the one time someone has ever asked me to cut a line from my review where i was like um this actress couldn't be like hotter if she like ate like a jug of beefaroni and sat on my face <laughs> Um, and he was like, can you oh cut that God. line? I'm like, no, because like, I really love this line. So like, and we would get people that would come out, that would like go fucking ape shit during these movies. We did, um, awesome. dear God, no, which can, which combines yes. like bikers, Nazis, Bigfoot, Frankenstein, and like everybody. It was bigger, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. And that movie is so good. And I remember like everyone going hog wild for it. But then one dude getting up and being like midway through the movie being like, I am super offended. Fuck you. I am never coming to any of your movies again. And walking out, I'm like, I can't think of a better compliment. Like we I love you know, I love those experiences. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely not the kind of movie that you're talking about, but I remember I drove an hour to the one theater that was playing uh Steve McQueen's Shame. Mm-hmm. With Michael Fassbender, which was an NC-17 movie about Michael Fassbender playing a sex addict. Mm -hmm. And there's a scene where Michael Fassbender has a threesome with two women, and he's basically basically eating ass. And this older gentleman, which I don't know why he was even there in the first place, stood up, pointed at the screen, and just goes, no! And laughed (laughs) so pissed. Like, that is where he drew the line, you know? Look, I would say at the part of the pendulum, we are very pro eating ass. Okay, <laughs> we are all for it. You're absolutely you oh get your face in there and you fucking numb Do numb what numb you will. Town. Uh, <laughs> so I'm trying to think. Like, oh, have you ever seen? There's a movie we didn't come here to. I didn't come here to die. No, I haven't. So it's a little indie movie. It's um, very much in the vein of something like Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Except instead of having this situation where it's like college kids and uh, rednecks that are kind of like at odds with one another and everything's a disagreement there. It's the, these group of like camp counselors go out into the woods and there's just like a series of accidents that kill them one by one. Um, <laughs> it's really brilliantly done. It was one of my favorite little indie movies. And what was that called? Called I Didn't Come Here to Die. It's funny about like how all these indie movies just sound like they'd be titles of like Carly Rae Jepsen songs. Of course, you know, or 70s exploitation movies. Yeah, um, oh, so good. The one movie I wanted to show that we couldn't get, per- I think I did show it and just said, fuck it, I won't advertise it. I'll just say like secret screening because that because I couldn't get the okay. There was this German production of a movie and you know, God damn, if they fucking hear this and like, you know, 10 years later, sue me um, for the hundred dollars I made that night. Um, there was this German production of a, a movie with an American cast called Must Love Death. Hmm. And it's about this person like he, the, it's about this like person who breaks up with his girlfriend and he's really suicidal. And he like answers this letter about this other guy that wants to kill himself 
and they're going to go to this little cabin oh. in the woods, and they're going to do, kill themselves. Except what really it is is you have this super fucking deranged dude who looks like kind of a mini Robert Carlyle who <laughs> just wants to film him and his buddy torturing this dude to death. And it's, nice. like, half romantic comedy because it jumps back and forth between, like... And, oh, also, like, there's a Galaxy Quest-type um, Star Trek ripoff show that's being filmed during it, too. It's wickedly funny. Uh, it's one of the most disgusting, goriest, bloody, like, definitely cringe when you're watching the screen. And it would definitely have been from this, like, early 2000s era where it was... I wonder if that was based on that real incident that happened. I think it might have been Germany. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? There's definitely one where, like, there's the person who um, he took ate, out an ate, ad. Yeah, yeah, he wanted to eat somebody, and the other person was like, "Sure." And it was consensual, though, right? I mean, my yeah, it was consensual, and like, like Marilyn Manson even made an album that, yeah. like, it was called "Eat Me, Drink Me," where that was based on that whole. Like, the album wasn't, but the title was based on that whole case. It's so weird. Yeah, this was uh, Andreas Shep's movie. Must Love huh. Death. I don't know if you can actually... It's from 2009. I remember I first saw it at the New York uh, City Horror Film Festival. I don't even know if it's like officially available here. I think I ended up bu- buying the DVD, like an import of it for like 30 or 40 bucks, which is something that... Can I you would... imagine... Can you imagine like accidentally just not really like not having your glasses on and not looking at the the third word and thinking that you're about to see must love dogs and go into that? Yes, exactly. You know, it was like that joke from The Office where Pam is like thought she rented like 28 days with Sandra Bullock and she actually got (laughs) 28 days later. Yeah, it's not even showing as available in the United States, but it's really brilliant. And it was just one of those things where – God damn, I really love that movie. I know we're kind of getting off the track here a little bit, but um, it's just a really fun fucking movie. Yeah, definitely. But I I think that 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 actually, I think, does tie into Joyride 3 because I think when all is said and done, that's exactly what Joyride is, and that's exactly what Joyride 3... I meant Joyride 3, but that's exactly what Joyride 3 is and what it knows it is. It's just fun. It's not meant to be like a social statement on anything, it's not meant to be this kind of like a twenty four esque movie, you know. It's it's just a throwback to having fun watching watching you know stupid mm-hmm. horror films, and uh, I love it for that. Right. Not everything has to be quote unquote elevated horror. Yeah, yeah. You know, not everything needs to be Death Wave. Right. Beautiful. All right. What else do we have on Joyride Three? I think I'm good, to be honest. I I think we've said a lot. I do want to say something really quick, and I'm not trying to step on us talking about recent things that we're doing, but, like, quite literally, about up until 10 seconds before we started this episode, I was reading on the Shudder newsletter Mm -hmm. an article that you wrote that I have to say was so good, and I would... Definitely recommend our listeners signing up for that newsletter on horse profound empathy. So props to Mike for that one. I am looking for it because as we um, as we started the record, uh, Jen and Lara from Psychoanalysis text were like, "Hey, you're up on the bite." And is it not on the bite? Like, where do you get? Yeah, it? it's on the bite. I I, I I don't see it yet. Yeah, I'll forward it to you. But yeah, good well, work. It, if it's any good, it's because of the notes that uh, Ariel. Fisher sent over because like I submitted the first piece based on something I had written a while back and she um, like really gave me some amazing notes to the point where it looks way different and I think it's strictly because like she really took the time to make it a much stronger piece and steer me so we'll post a link to it on the show notes if I can find it because I'm pretty proud of the piece not to toot my own horn but it's about how Horror movies can help you find empathy in persons or cultures or backgrounds that are different from your own, more so than any other genre. Yeah, definitely. I, I enjoyed so, it. So, um, Another thing that can help you find empathy is because times are tough right now, <laughs> and we all want that content. We all need that content, and we all want more of that content. Jerry, what are we doing over in Patreon? 
We are doing so much, and uh, so I, I think maybe we're doing a little too much, but fuck it. Uh, well, we haven't done much yet. We are going yeah, to be doing so much. We're going to be doing so much. Uh, for our patrons on Patreon, which uh, we talked about the last episode, the different tiers, which are very affordable if you, if you feel inclined to throw some bones our way. Uh, we're doing a special episode we're recording this Sunday uh, on a one-off on It Follows, which is such – I love that movie, and it's not going to be just like a 45-minute chat. I can definitely tell. I know the notes that I've written myself – are, are pretty extensive, and I know Michael, too. It's going to be a, a definitely uh, weighty episode, and our guest is Chris Dudley from the band Under Oath, uh, the uh, pretty big metalcore band. Uh, you know, it was his choice, so we're stoked on doing that. Uh, and we have so much in the works. We have a lot of opportunities that have been presented to us about, like, different, like, one-off chats with people that we're trying to see if, like, okay, do we tackle this for the patrons, you know, or do we just wait and put it off, that kind of stuff. So we're talking about that, but we also have a couple special things that we're doing, kind of a teaser to the Patreons. Uh, we're going to be recording a fan commentary of Halloween 4, which is so huge to me, and I've wanted to do this for so long. It's going to be, uh, we're going to do it with our good friend and friend of the show, Nat Brimmer, who is, we're going to do a Halloween 4 commentary as kind of a tease to what our patrons can have. It's going to be available to everyone, but the our patrons... Uh, we're going to cut off the, you know, intros and yeah, all that so stuff. Yeah, so for our patrons, we'll cut off this part of it, which will basically be me pimping the Patreon um, for 10 minutes before we get to the commentary. Um, but we, you know, Jerry just came up, he just, you know, messaged me like, do you want to do a Halloween 4 commentary tomorrow night? And I'm like, yes, I do, but I'm fucking slammed right now. Um, so we made an agreement, like, I think Monday night we're going to do... Uh, or I think either Monday, early next week, we're going to record the Halloween four fan commentary with Nat. Nat, by the way, just out of the blue, like wrote a, a little chat book on essays about the Halloween series. I would tweet him at Nat Bremar over on Twitter and ask for them because they're free. Um, and they're I think he did one on Friday the 13th, too. He also did that. Like he's basically... You know, in the time it's taking us to record this, he's probably written about 40,000 words on Child's Play because he's just that good. Um, so he's, he's going to be joining for this. And all, He's the only guy – He's really quickly, he's the only guy that could write 2,000 to 2,500 words on Avril Lavigne's Skater Boy and make it super interesting. Yeah. He um, – every time we have him on, it's a treat because he's just this font of not only knowledge but enthusiasm. Like it's one thing to be really knowledgeable. It's another thing to be able to present that in a way that's really enthusiastic and passionate and makes you interested in hearing it. So that's going to be interesting and a lot of fun. So we'll have two Patreon episodes this week. Uh, or this month, which will be It Follows, like Mary mentioned, and the fan commentary, Terry. Part of the reason we're doing an extra episode is that will be our show that week because I want an extra week to prepare for the Nightmare on Elm Street series, which I am so excited to start doing. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be huge. It's funny because last night, um, you know, my daughter and I went to the little basement theater, um, which I really need to get a fan down there because it was just hot, just balls down there. Um, and we watched the first Elm Street together, uh, which she still jumped like at three specific points in the movie. Like she jumped out of the beanbag chair. Like it really got her. Um, but she said, Dad, like, when are you doing these? And I'm like, oh, we're going to start in a couple weeks. And she's like, well, I thought you weren't doing them till next year. But I couldn't wait any longer. Like, I really <laughs> want to space out some of the bigger franchises because I am definitely dreading the day when it's like, oh, crap, what do we have left? Like, what film? Oh, we have, like, the Leprechaun series left. And that's really it um so i've been trying like to judiciously space out when we cover some of the bigger franchises that uh, and I, uh i i think mm -hmm. with the elm street series i know what i'd like to do and you know if, if you're on board we should definitely do this i think i want to have the nightmare on elm street episodes like usual but for our patrons like i've been kind of spitballing trying to reach out to some of the people from the actual films to maybe like small short chats about the films themselves for our patrons oh i would so do that i would so do like many 
10 minute bites that are like patron exclusive. If we yeah. Can so I've, I've reached know. out to at least probably like eight or nine people so far. So like, I would love to talk to Rachel Talalay about Freddy's dead. Cause I love that movie. And I think that it's tremendously underappreciated and such a perfect capper for the series for what it was at that point. Um, and it's like so fun and imaginative and kind of gets what, you know, it really to me has this like punk rock spirit that is like rooted in her work, working with folks like John Waters. And mm-hmm. um, I don't think that movie gets enough love, you know, overall. I think people don't appreciate how much fun that movie is. That and goddamn, that Goo Goo Doll song is good. Of course, man. Every Goo Goo Doll song is good, man. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I really can't wait. I think we put a lot of, like, effort and energy into the Alien series. Um, and we're really looking forward to, like, re- replicating that effort with the Elm Street series with what we're going to hopefully bring to the table and hopefully we do those films justice. So for folks that want to become a patron of the show, go to patreon.com slash pod and the pendulum tiers start at two dollars two bucks gets you the bonus content like you will get the bonus shows for two dollars we're not asking for a huge contribution to give you that extra content because we think that anybody that would give us any money deserves a thank you and our form of thanks is giving folks the bonus content so you get at least one bonus show a month at least one blog post a month and access to the slack channel where we're able to talk um horror movies together five bucks a month gets you some swag we have like pins we'll have stickers um we'll have some other stuff that we're going to be doing in the future um ten dollars a month right now gets you both of those things it will get you the bonus content quicker there won't be any delay on it um and it will also get you access to our show notes um and in the future i would like to do some other very cool swag like maybe coffee mugs or t-shirts or something. Yeah, that's down the road a little bit. So if you go to podinthependulum.com slash Patreon, um, nope, that's the opposite. Patreon.com slash podinthependulum and become a patron today. All that money goes back into the show. Um, I've designed a little website for us that has everything all in one place. Um, I'm just waiting to, you know get a little bit of extra cash just so we can pay to host it all at once for a year and not and just set it and forget it at that point. All right. I don't want to spend the whole rest of the show talking Patreon. So Jerry, where can folks find us? Uh, we're on Twitter. I'm at Jerry is just okay. Mike is at Mike uh, underscore Snootian. Uh, we have the podcast at Pod and Pendulum. And uh, there you go. Yeah, we have a little Facebook group. You go to facebook.com, go pod, uh, look for Pod and the Pendulum, and you'll find us. And, Jerry, what do you have coming out, man? You've been putting out some music. You've just scored a short film. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bunch of things. Uh, out yeah, I just put out uh, a few just different instrumental tracks because that's mostly what I do electronic music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm scoring a film right now. Uh, I can't say what it is, but it's the most. It's the funnest experience I've ever had doing something like that. It is mm-hmm. so weird. It's like David Lynch meets Cormac McCarthy. It's so crazy. Uh, I have a couple article, articles articles hitting uh, this week. I have an interview with fucking Static X for Dread Central. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I have a – I don't know when it's coming out in Scream Magazine, but I just – turned in a retrospective on Jaws the Revenge that I was asked to do. Oh, jeez. Oh, I okay. I know. And I uh, a really cool site that's about to launch uh, asked me to do a few things for him. So I wrote about my favorite film art books, uh, and and I'm also writing a retrospective on uh, Captain Bigelow's Blue Steel for them. So that's what I have coming up. Excellent. Excellent. Very good. All right, listeners, we hope, you know, we have now wrapped up another franchise. A little quick little detour here with Joyride 3. Uh, three fun and breezy movies you're able to do. Um, and we will be back next week with our Halloween 4 fan commentary with Matt Bremar. And then after that, every town has an Elm Street. I think that was perfect. Someone yelled bye in the background right when that ended. That's perfect, man.